So every day I followed up pretty much twice a day. And um, some some time later, I think it was about 10 days later, uh, they he called me and he said, guess what? We're going to send you to our Quebec office, Montreal, uh, for an interview with my business partners. And uh, there were a few owners to the company. So they flew me to Montreal and they said, if you're willing to spend that much time and effort to get a job, we can imagine how much time you'd spend to keep a job. So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by a Canadian guest, which is Glenn Poulos, who is the VP and GM of Gap Wireless. He's also a business coach and now he's the best-selling author just recently of a book called Never Sit in the Lobby. Uh, welcome to the show, Glenn. Lovely to have you here. Hi, thanks for, thanks for having me, Deborah. Good morning to you oh, and, your, and your, your guests. <laughs> or your your uh, your listeners. Listeners, um, yeah. yeah. So we've just been having a bit of a chat as we always do before we get onto these podcasts. I've been hearing the story about Glenn, which is really fascinating. I'd love to you to share your journey because you've had two successful exits in business. You've now written yeah. a book. You're sharing that expertise with others. Tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are now. Great, um, happy to share that. the uh, the story The part of the story I really love to tell is how I made the transition from being a federal government worker, a civil servant, as we call them in Canada. Um, it was a technical role and uh, it was the weather service in Canada. And um, my boss pulled me aside and said, you're, you're not, you know, you're, you're working too fast. You're working too hard. You need to go get a job somewhere else. And I recommend you get into sales. And, and so because I was technical, I reached out to uh, a, a job for a technical sales rep job. It was only one. And uh, I sent in a, um, uh, you know, a, a resume. It's, I think it's pretty much the only resume I'd ever written. And, um, cause the government hired me right out of school. I didn't even need a resume. And, um, the, uh, to make a long story short, the guy interviewed me and sent me on my way. And, uh, the next morning I phoned the receptionist at the company and said, uh, did I get the job? You know? And, uh, she's like, well, we're still looking at candidates. So I'm like, okay. And so that afternoon I called back and I said, uh, what about now? Do we? And she's like, dude, we're still looking at candidates. I'm like, okay. So the next day I called and I said, you know, the man's name was Kim. I said, is Kim, uh, is Kim there? No, he's busy. And I'm like, okay, have you made a decision? No, Glenn, we'll get back to you. Okay. So I, every day I followed up pretty much twice a day. And, um, some, some time later, I think it was about 10 days later, uh, they, he called me and he said, guess what? We're going to send you to our Quebec office, Montreal, uh, for an interview with my business partners. And, uh, there were a few owners to the company. So they flew me to Montreal at the time I was driving around, uh, fixing government, uh, equipment at weather stations, <clears throat> driving the, uh, the cheapest car money could buy. It was like a Chevy Chevette with, with manual windows, no air conditioning, no radio, government green. Um, you know, it was this crappy car. And I never thought much of it, but when the uh, owner of the company in Quebec picked me up at the airport, he was driving driving a BMW 750, oh, and nice. I'm like, "Wow, this sales game is really interesting." And uh, <laughs> I was only 20 something at the time, and pretty pretty impressionable, right? And uh, so we pulled into his office, and the other two partners' cars were parked there as well, and they all had matching BMW 750s with license plates that were one digit apart. And I said, I'm definitely getting a job in sales. And uh, so they interviewed me, sent me back, and he eventually hired me. And shortly after he hired me, he said, you know, I just want to share with you that you were you were not our, the candidate we wanted to hire. He said, you weren't even on the list of <laughs> candidates we wanted to hire. And I'm like, okay, well, why did you hire me then? And he said, because you were the only one that followed up twice a day for 10 days. Mm -hmm. And they said, if you're willing to spend that much time and effort to get a job, we can imagine how much time you'd spend to keep a job. And, um, and so I worked with them for five years and, um, I, I approached them, uh, after five years about spinning off part of their company into a separate company that them and I would own. Um, but I would sort of get to run this division and they would get to enjoy the benefits of that. And I was going to focus on this newfangled, uh, technology and they said, oh, write us a plan and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll let you know why it's probably just won't work and you're better off just staying where you're at. And, you know, and so the next day I resigned, I'd only been married for six days mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> yeah, and 
I went home to my wife. I said, oh, guess what? I quit. And she's like, what? And, uh, but anyways, I quit. And that newfangled technology, which never went anywhere, is called the cell phone, right? And of course, that never <laughs> amounted to anything. Nice. And, um, I, you know, and so the, uh, the business was focused on, on wireless, uh, mobile wireless, and ran the business with some partners for um, 15 years, sold that business. And then um, I left that business and ended up starting a similar, uh, you know, the similar customer based business, uh, selling slightly different products uh, and ran it for another 15 years uh, and just sold that in February to a U.S. private equity uh, and the, a company they bought in the U.S. bought us. And so I'm now this company that I've been running for 15 years, Gap Wireless, we're now part of a much bigger U.S. company. And I agreed to stay on with them for a few years and uh, help them you know, work in the business and I'm pretty much doing the same job running Canada. And um, yeah, and that's, that's how I got to where I am today. Wow. That's one hell of a story. Um, so your wife obviously forgave you in the end. <laughs> she did indeed. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. And did you, more importantly, did you actually get the BMW? In your yeah. So, job? well, you know, it's funny because I actually, I turned into a Mercedes driver and, uh, and, and um, <laughs> similar, similar type of car, similar, you know, from the same, same part of the world. But, uh, but yeah, I ended up becoming a, a, a Mercedes driver and I love them to death actually. Yeah. Excellent. Love, love that car. Hey, um, great story. Now, this book, um, I believe, actually launched on the same week that you sold the yeah, business. That you, so that's tell true. us a little bit about the book and where did that come from? Yeah. Over, so the, overnight success, right? It was just yeah, a for right sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was just a few weeks ago in, uh, in 1985. And um, so, yeah, I started when I, when I, I had the actually privilege of um, working with some really, uh, grassroots salespeople at this company that that when I left the government and the the main owner of that company the president was he's one of those consummate salespeople and not not like the like when you think peddler you know guy banging on doors selling encyclopedias but I mean just just amazed you when how great he was with customers and um you know never really got stumped you know when you think oh what do I what would I say if I got asked that or he just always was was basic was was great at handling objections and and he was just such a professional and I really paid close attention to what he did and I I started to learn some of his you know, we'll call them tricks, but they weren't, you know, he, he was just, these are just uh, tips on how to do it right, really, you know, and I started, and so I started seeing them, and I started seeing other things and other people, and I started writing them down and, and naming them after people, and then I started noticing some mistakes, I started writing those down, then I started sort of sharing them in a joking way, uh, and, um, you know, saying like, oh, you just did a Barry Watson or something like that. And everyone's like, oh, what's a Barry Watson? And I'm like, oh, that's when you do this and this. And they're like, oh, that's hilarious. And you should write a book. And, you know, and so, uh, you know, it wasn't until many years later. And uh, really, it was during the pandemic that when I had a lot of free time, as we all did, and got stuck at home, mm -hmm. uh, that I decided to, you know, put pen to paper and and get uh you know get cracking on writing the book and um so during that part of the pandemic where it was you know the major lockdown i um i worked on it and then you know uh that's uh when it, when i had enough words i started working with the editors and um you know was able to launch it in february of 2022 you know mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yeah. That's absolutely, and yeah. I know that you shared with me that, um, you know, writing a book had came with some discipline, right? You yes, some, indeed. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that sort of journey. Yeah. So I tried writing it actually uh, probably 10 years ago and I got a little bit here and a little bit there. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I looked, I actually found a tool, um, uh, Scrivener, I think it's called, and uh, to, that helps authors to write. And, and I and I did, I was able to get a lot of the the rules written in as titles and things, which was very helpful. And I had always kept it up to date, but I'd never really done any decent writing. And I um, because I wasn't really disciplined at it, and it wasn't a, a core competency really. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just I basically Googled uh, how do you write a book, and um, which is pretty much what everyone does for everything nowadays, right? Yep, yep. <laughs> and, uh, and so it said, the guy, a podcast came on and the guy said, just write 500 words a day until you're done and then you're done. And everyone, anyone can write a book, you know, and, um, and don't 
stop writing the five those words until 500 are done like don't do a 50 and then go get a coffee and you know take a break go for a walk just sit down write 500 and i and so i had decided that as a compromise because i couldn't really do it every day based on my work schedule that i was going to write 2000 to 2500 words every saturday and sunday and and so i committed to it and i started and um i would get up early on the weekends and i would I would take each one of the chapters that I had outlined and I had quite a few of them and I was able to, um, you know, get basically 75 words, 75,000 words down in, in short order. And as I had shared with you earlier, as I said, once it got to the editor and the lady shared with me, she said, Glenn, you can't swear that much in a book. And so we agreed to take out the F 4,000 copies of the F word. And I ended up <laughs> finalizing on 71,000 words as the book length. Oh, and uh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, she said, yeah. you can swear you can get three F's and a, and a, and a goddamn or something like that. But other than that, you, uh, is that it? Is that the yeah. Limit? So, oh. some, yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> and so I said, okay, fine. And, uh, but yeah, it, you know, in all seriousness, it's, uh, it's about 71,000 words. And, uh, and, and so what, what is the purpose of the book? Like if somebody's sitting here listening to it, you know, what, what would they get out of reading that book? So the, so basically the book is kind of like a how to uh, for the person that visits customers it's ma it's very uh, well geared for it. there's other rules about uh, being a good salesperson that can be applied to sort of people maybe that work online and stuff like that these are just general rules on rapport and things like that but where it really resonates is with the person that has to be face to face with customers right of course we all you know kind of had this jostling with the pandemic where we kind of that all ended and evaporated right but we, but right up until like march 19th 20 march 20th you know 2020 i mean in canada at least i mean our people needed to be in front of customers every day right there was no such thing as wfh work from home and zoom was there but i mean nobody had it and um and it was really a moment in time and i mean uh, we've been struggling as much as we can to get back in front of each one of our customers as quickly as possible and so more now than ever people are like oh how do i get back in front of the customer what do i say you know this and that and so these are tips that um you know you can open up to any page and sort of learn a tip on just different aspects of um you know of selling and you don't have to start at the beginning and read the entire book in order to get the message. It's not a formulaic approach. It's not like the challenger sales model or spin selling where each one of the chapters is sort of a prerequisite to what comes next. Um, you know, and it's not a system. It's a series of 57 rules and tips on how to build a business and a career in selling. And that's what it is. Some of them are very short and sweet. Some of them are more rambling on in terms of the, the, the meaning and stuff. And you'll be surprised, you know, the, it covers everything from, you know, the title, never sit in the lobby. Right. Yeah. And, uh, to how to behave at a dinner with customers and vendors, you know, yeah. um, yeah. because I saw a lot of, uh, a lot of the right way to do it and a lot of the wrong way to do it when I was, you know, well, throughout my entire career, but especially, uh, when I was younger, you know, um, and I'd see lots of junior salespeople and what have you like performing, behaving poorly and that not knowing how to behave properly in a business environment. So, mm. uh, you know, I chose to write all those down for people to learn and um, other tips and tricks on um, how to get and stay in front of customers. Love it. So what's been the biggest mistake that you've seen people make, whether they be young or old, but in sales, what's the biggest thing that you see? <sighs> Well, one of the biggest ones I see a lot is, um, uh, well, one of the, one of the, a big one, maybe not the biggest, but, uh, it's called, it's in the book and it's called implied familiarity also breeds contempt. And so, and it's a rule, it's part of the rapport series in the book. And, um, I don't know if, uh, you've ever heard the, the story, uh, or the saying familiarity breeds contempt. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, you go away with six friends in a van driving somewhere across New Zealand or whatever. And by the time you get home, you don't know, talk to four of them, <laughs> if you know what I mean, right? Yes. Yeah. yes. You know the joke there? And yep. um, But I made up this one called implied familiarity also breeds contempt. And I, it's easiest to understand it by the story that I tell, which is uh, going into a customer and the guy has a, a photo behind his desk and he was with another man holding the thing. And I said to him, 
oh wow you're a fisherman and uh looks like you know you're a bass fisherman or whatever it that's amazing you know um maybe we should go fishing sometime or whatever and the guy looks over his shoulder and he goes oh my god he goes that you know what that's my ex father-in-law he goes we're divorced now. I actually can't stand that guy. And I actually <laughs> effing hate fishing too. Grabs the photo, throws it away. And, you know, the whole idea, and the whole idea is that by making that assumption that he, just because there was a photo there and he was holding a fish that he loved fishing and it was all part of his thing. And that's what he did every weekend. You're, you're making all these assumptions mm -hmm. that you really shouldn't. And there's a lot more rapport building required it before you just, invite the guy to go fishing on the weekend, right? <laughs> it's a little uh, bit weird. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just mm. too much, too soon, too fast, right? Mm. And it's fake and it's phony. And yep. even nowadays, especially, people are like hypersensitive to those kinds of things. Um, you know, they're just more aware with the, you know, with media and social media of, hey, you're just, you know, that's just fake rapport, right? And um, so I always, you know, I always challenge people to, you um, you know, try to try to build genuine rapport with people. You know, mm -hmm. I love the saying, God gave you two ears and one mouth. So, you know, you do the math mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and uh, I talk a lot in the book about active listening. And um, there's even an exercise and a game in there that I tr challenge you to pl you play with your spouse or partner or, wh or what have you, um, yeah. where you can only say a very short group of uh, things like, Oh my, really? What happened next? Uh, how did that make you feel? Oh my God. And there's five or six of them listed and you're not allowed to That's say it. anything. And then you have to go home and try to trigger a conversation, but just say those things and then see how the conversation goes. And mm -hmm. all, quite often what you end up finding out is that the person like, oh, say, oh man, it's really great talking to you tonight. It's, you're so, you're such a good listener, right? <laughs> and uh, because people really just, they don't want a lot of advice. They don't want cliche um you know uh suggestions and advice they just want to be heard they just want to like tell you the story to get it off of their their chest or what have you right and so um yeah i share a lot on rapport in the book actually i suspect that's particularly good for husbands and wives i know that yes for a, sure um, husbands definitely have a tendency to want to jump in and sort of solve the yeah. solve the problem that you don't actually yes really exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. And now I'm going to go back a little bit to your business now outside of the sure. book because um, obviously we, we actually met through a, a pub match, which is a, a podcasting sort right. of, um, uh, what do you call it? It's an online dating almost. But your business that you run, Gap Wireless, actually runs on EOS. And you're working it with does. my fellow EOS implementers, Al. Yeah. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your, your business and, um, you know, because it's fantastic. You've been able to sell it, obviously, at a good time. How? Yeah, the, the journey to go from being what was effectively a, a startup to being a 40, what, 41 person business yeah. that was then sold to a much bigger business. Can you share a little bit yeah. of that journey with us? Yeah, um, the uh, we started on our EOS journey about three years ago. Uh, we were going into our third annual. Um, yeah, we've been at like a full three years, I believe, or we maybe it's our fourth annual. Um, and so, but uh, around the 2018, 2019 uh, timeframe anyways, we, I'd realized that um, I have this sort of, sort of, uh, it's not a saying, but just this thing where whenever I get scared about the, the future, the business level or something like that, like where you, and right now the economy in North America, it's feeling questionable right it may be the same in in uh new zealand and um but it feels like 2023 is not going to be a you know as financially uh, lucrative as 2022 was right for you know real estate's down and all that business spending yep. you know layoffs and what have you right so the natural reaction is that you get paranoid or whatever right and so my natural reaction when i feel that feeling coming on is to just do a whole lot of crap right and so Right. Like rather than cower in fear, I'm like, let's just do something. Right. Like, and you know, and I mean, and I'm very passionate about it with the people. I'm like, we got to do something. We have to do more. Like, and they're like, what? I will, I don't care. Let's just do something. Right. And the, cause we're not going to, we're not going to worry our way out of the problem. We have to sell our way out of the problem. Right. And, um, the, um, and so, uh, I, I realized at the time the business we had, uh, we didn't really have, 
you know, now I have all the, the vernacular of EOS, so I don't want to taint my, <laughs> my, my feelings back then. Cause I would start using, you know, but the system, we didn't have an operating system. Right. And I, and honestly, I just use Google again. I said, and I, I don't know what I Googled, you know, like, you know, I, but, but I Googled something along the lines of business systems. Right. Mm -hmm. And EOS popped up pretty, you know, probably fairly high up. And, um, I was able to read that it was, you know, um, a system to help you, you know, structure your business in a, you know, and, uh, you know, cover all aspects of, of building and growing the business. Right. And, um, I ended up setting up a meeting, uh, I called, a, uh, maybe I filled out the form and, uh, they lined me up with a couple, uh, or two or three integrators in not integrators, but, uh, facilitators in Toronto. And Al was the first one to call me back from his holiday in Greece. And, um, <laughs> he's like machine that man. Yeah. And I'm also <laughs> Greek too, by the way. So it was very oh, wow. rapport okay. building <laughs> that he yeah. called me from the homeland. Right. Yeah. And, um, and so, and, but in the end, I just felt that the rapport was best with, with Al. So, um, we signed on with him, but you know what we really, we didn't have any of the things really in place that, um, you know, that EOS calls for. And, as, as a matter of fact, just prior to, um, no, it was sort of just, it was just after coming out of it. Um, it, it allowed me to come to another epiphany, which, um, which really, I don't want to say save the business, but uh, that wouldn't be overstating the issue. But in 2019, um, the, uh, shortly after we came on with, with Al, I had realized that, um, we had started spread ourselves thin and breaking a bunch of, of my other rules. We had gotten into divisions and departments that we shouldn't have started. Uh, and we were taking the profits, big profits from other, you know, uh, businesses since day one. And we were feeding these other things that we, we felt we had the right to be in these other areas of business. And it masks itself for a while because you're making so much money and you don't really, you know, it, you kind of take your eye off the ball of how well they're doing and you're still overall, you're doing well. And then one day, you know, the cash cow piece is down a bit. And then you start looking at yourself and say, wait a minute, like, okay, they're down a bit, but why is everything sucks so bad? And that's because everything you're making, you're spending on these other um, efforts in these other departments in these other areas, geographies, what have you people, and I came to my business partner on a Monday and, um, and I basically said to him, I said, uh, Mark, we're going to make some changes. I said, uh, <clears throat> right now we're at 80 people and, uh, by noon we'll be at 29. And, um, mm -hmm. we let go of, uh, we let go of all those people, whatever that is, you know, 51 people mm -hmm. in one, in one morning and um, to re restructure the business so that we could become profitable. And we were gonna lose a, almost a million and a half dollars that year, yeah. uh, all because of these, because the our core business was down and it had been fading and funding these other ones. And we had been a little bit too enamored of our own capabilities to realize that we'd let these things run amok. Yeah. And our finance guy, so, so and you kind ahead. of lost lost track of what your real um you know the hedgehog yeah. concept what your core focus really was yeah yeah and the whole right person right seat mm. um you know and core markets focus you know all of all of the things we play to and we we fo we we identify and, and and review with al every 90 days right yeah. and um and so you know i you know it's not as bad as it seems in terms of the number of people in 40 of them we were, it was a different division, a service division. And we were, we were already um, sort of tap dancing with some uh, other companies that might want to take the business over. But that morning we made the call to say, look, can we make a deal this way, that way? And we were able to get a verbal sort of agreement and that dealt with 40 of them. And then we closed, uh, we let go of the people in uh, the United States that we'd hired and we weren't managing properly from afar. Um, and there was a small division that we'd also started and we closed that division, but we sold it to a, we didn't really sell it. We just transferred the assets and the people to a competitor that mm -hmm. took, took all the products at cost and, uh, took the staff without any, you know, without, no one lost the jobs. And in the end, no one really lost their jobs per se, cause they were all sort of repositioned elsewhere and what have you. And it worked out, you know, worked out reasonably well. And we went on to, uh, world record profits for ourselves in the following year in 2020 mm. and which set the stage for 2021 and 2022 when we sold the business yeah. and we sticked really, uh, 
you know, diligently to the tenets of EOS and especially, you know, uh, structure first, people second, yep. you know, uh, real pe uh, right person, right seat, you know, um, and uh, GWC, get it, want it, cap you know, capacity. Yep. And uh, those are the, the and, and so much so that the, uh, our American parent, um, you know, points at our, our structure and our discipline, like they see it as a disciplined way of operating mm -hmm. as being a model. And they look at themselves and they said, wow, I mean, yeah, we've done well financially in the U S but it's 10 times bigger market and we don't have any, you know, and they're looking actually to, um, uh, to potentially uh, do, adopting EOS in their U S operation. They're actually going to sit in our two day next week mm -hmm. in order to get a much better feel of it. So yeah. Yeah, it's been a game changer for us. And that's why I don't see any need. Like Al was saying, it's time for you to graduate. And I'm like, why? I mean, I just want to go for my master's and my PhD, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's an interesting concept, actually, because a lot of people, we always talk about, we, we do want people to graduate. We want you to actually teach you how to use the tools and it becomes part of your everyday uh, way of operating. Um, but it is actually quite helpful to have somebody who can be an external participant and actually run those yeah. sessions for you because we sometimes just we can see things because we're looking from the outside in as opposed to working on the inside and, and looking at the team around us. So, yeah. Yeah. So what do you, so, I mean, you've talked about some of the tools there already and, and for people think sitting here thinking about, you know, what is EOS and what will I do for my business? Obviously that structure first, people second, making sure you've got the right people in the right seats, make sure the GW is in the seat. Is there a particular tool that you really like in EOS that sort of was a game changer for you? And I, I appreciate the whole thing has been a game changer, but is there any one thing that really stands out? Well, yeah, <laughs> I always pride myself on trying to be brutally honest. So yeah. the, um, and I called it, I called out myself that the last time we got together with Al for the quarterly was that I think we'd kind of forgotten of all of a lot of the tools. And he's like, well, they're all there in the binder. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, it's not self-evident that they're there in a way and they don't teach you themselves. And, and mm -hmm. so we were just using the basics for the most part, except for a few things like the, um, you know, the core value analysis where you do the plus minus, yep. plus minus, plus minus, I can't remember what it's called, but, um, people analyzer, people analyzer, exactly. Yep. And, um, uh, a few of the other ones, but the one that was, we were, we do use and we have been using, which has been the game changer, and again, I'm not exactly sure if this is what it's called, but it's a clear the air session, right? Yeah, or, yeah. And um, that was one of the probably, <clears throat> you know, one of the, you know, although it's probably trademarked or whatever, but in my next book, I would I point to it as being a game changer uh, discipline to learn in order to thrive in business with your staff, with your coworkers and compatriots yeah. and you know, other managers and stuff and just getting through uh, problem times and what have you. The clear the air has been a game changer for us. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it really has the other thing, which is the, the accountability chart, which it's kind of hard for people to understand the accountability chart until you live the accountability chart. And for me, mm -hmm. it's like second nature and I don't, you know, but I'm trying to explain it to him and I'm like, why can't you get it? It's not that complicated. Right. And it's like, well, what's the difference between an org chart and whatever? And I was like, well, it's like, like an org chart, but it, you know, it's more about what you're accountable for. And I mm -hmm. like try to show, Hey, look, I exist here at the top, but I also exist down here at the bottom. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I'm accountable for that. Yeah. But when I'm in that box, I'm actually, you know, below another guy and mm -hmm. I'm actually his guy for that in that box. I'm not the integrator when I'm in that role. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you're like, Oh, okay. You know, because I mean, how would the, uh, owner of the company report to the warehouse manager, you know, if, or something, right. I completely agree. Yeah. And I think it's, it's certainly yeah. something I've seen. I've got one of my clients who's a little bit sort of on the spectrum, who's actually gone ahead and sort of, you know, he's, he's a, a fast growing business. He's gone ahead and kind of developed his accountability shop for five years into the future. Wow. And so he's got all of the different roles that he believes will be there. And I'm sure it will change over time, but he believes they're the roles that will actually be there. And so as a consequence, many of his team are wearing multiple hats, but what it does, it gives them real clarity about which hat are they wearing? when they're in that particular meeting you know what role do they have in terms of accountability in that particular meeting and then it also makes it really easy to do the, the new hires because when you suddenly find yourself being completely overwhelmed you look at it and go right well we've got all these um, hats that I'm wearing right now what is the most obvious one for us to hire to actually um, you know delegate and elevate <laughs> yeah exactly um, yeah so it's, it's a great tool it really is yeah. and, and it, you're yeah. right it does I think it's really important for business owners to understand 
understand what accountability role they're playing in which part of the business. You know, so when you're in a meeting, where what are you? Which hat are you wearing? <laughs> right. Yeah. And so I'm trying to. Um, I had sort of touched on it with Al the last time, and now I mean, but a goal of mine is to sort of figure out a way of like getting a better job of do, of learning the other tools and getting them more into the day to day. Cause some of them that you have to use them every day, but the other ones yeah. are more a resource that you have to reach out for, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just like any kind of support, if you don't reach out for the support, it can't help you. Right. Yeah, and sure. um, yeah. And so, yeah, I have, I do have a, uh, a personal goal to get a little bit more familiar with some of the other tools in the toolbox that I don't use on a regular basis. Right. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's an interesting concept, actually. How do we make sure we keep that stuff top of mind? Because you're right, it's, it's yeah. such an amazing resource. And you know, all the tools, the reason I fell in love with it, I've been coaching for, I think, almost 15 years now. I've been running businesses for, let's say, 30 years. Um, and, you know, it's, it's there's all this stuff in there that is really, really helpful, but you don't necessarily um, know that it's there. I've, got, I've lost my train of thought, but I'm trying to say it's like, it's actually, yeah. it's, nothing is rocket science. That's what I was going to say. They are really, really simple. There's nothing in there that you look at and kind of go, wow, this is like right. absolutely revolutionary. It's all very basic, simple, pragmatic tools that I've sort of been yeah. using. Them, but it's about how do we actually make sure we utilize them at the right time for exactly. the right purpose and yeah. don't lose track of them. Yeah. Yeah, because and I haven't been to one of the seminars, the the like the events, the EOS events at all. But um, like, there's not really in there's not really um, you know a two day intensive toolbox training thing. It's more because no. there's too much going on in your two day to really truly learn all of those tools that are in that toolbox. Right? There's yeah. a lot of them. Right? Mm -hmm. And so it's easy to forget that they're there. Yeah. And um, I hear you. I yeah. Hear you. And start thinking yeah. about that for my own clients. How do I make sure we actually keep those things top of mind? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing that, uh, you know, about the toolbox and the tools and what have you is also, it's just the, the discipline that we had put forth in the beginning in order to set our core values. Mm. And, um, you know, and really where it's come into focus is I'd seen some other people um, developing their own core values after like un unrelated companies and what have you, and the way they've sort of rushed through it and, mm -hmm. you know, where'd you get your core values? And well, I got them on Google, you know, <laughs> yeah. and uh, <laughs> yep. you know, that kind of a thing. Right. And we struggled hard, hard, hard with ours. Yep. And it was real, it was really a uh, tedious process, but we're now very committed to it. Mm -hmm. And we have a reward system in place. Um, it's kind of like a reward board system slash Facebook uh, app that we use Motivosity oh, yeah. where you eat all the staff, every staff gets a certain amount of money each month to reward another staff member for exercising a core value. Mm -hmm. Right. So committed to service excellence. I noticed that, uh, you know, a lady in the staff, Darina did a great job when I heard her on the phone with a customer and I can give her two bucks or five bucks or, you know, the staff get a smaller amount of money than I do or what have you. But every staff member gets money every month to, other to reward other staff members, but they have to call out a core value. I love it. I really yeah. enjoy that. Actually, I yeah. must admit, I, um, so before I joined EOS, which is about three years now, I had been coaching um, with the Ice House and my own coaching business. And one of the things that I loved about the EOS proven process was that there is a fair bit of time spent not doing the the core values and the vision and the mission and all that kind of stuff up front, but actually getting some tools in place first. So you actually yes. get some changes in the business first, but right. then the amount of time that is spent actually uncovering discovering and defining those core values yeah. as opposed to I mean I, I used to run sessions I'm talking about way before EOS where you know we do a whole day in the room where we talk about what the core values we pick some beautiful core values like oh yeah they're fantastic we'll go with those um, and they weren't really the core values of the organization they were kind of more permission to play values but also right. we'd leave that room very pumped and very excited about all this stuff we discovered then you go back out into the real world and nothing had changed so as a consequence you've got this beautiful long-term you know vision and mission and, and, and plan but but you can't actually execute on it and so when right. I when I came across this I love the fact that that first the, you know that first day is spent let's getting getting some tools in place let's learn some tools yeah. that can actually change the way the business runs and then we'll delve into that sort of the core values core purpose yeah etc etc yeah 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 we were we also ran a, a 16 week um a contest on the core values initiative and um 
it's called the CTO uh, challenge, I think they called it or something. Mm -hmm. And where it was kind of run like um, the game show um, with the letters and the Vanna White. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, what is that called? Uh, oh, my God. I can't believe I can't think of it right Wheel, now. Is but, Wheel of Fortune? Uh, Wheel of Fortune, yes. yeah. <laughs> Wheel of Fortune. So we basically, we had all the core values and we basically made all sorts of posters and uh, mouse pads and all sorts of, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? Promo items and the, and the like, and we distributed it to the staff and we had these every week we, you'd have to guess a letter based on a clue that was inside of a core value. Oh. And <laughs> you got to go to the website. You got to check the page where our core values are. You got to go to this and find out what, you know, and if you take this and that, whatever, and you come up and you feel like the, the letter that week was R mm. and then we were, you had to buy vowels and the, the money for the vowels went to charity and, mm. Um, but we ended up giving away a fair bit of money. I think the first prize was like 2000 bucks and then a thousand seven fifty, and, you know, and every, it was, there was full participation. Everyone participated. Um, and you know, I mean, and it was great, but now we have, we, the real funny thing is also checking your staff about, all right, give me the core values right now. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. That's really a good one. So and, how many, uh, I'm intrigued. How many do you actually have? So our core values are committed to service excellence, solution-driven, yep. passionate contribution, and results matter. Okay, great. We have four. Yeah, four. Yeah. I actually think uh, three or four is an ideal number. I know we've got five at EOS, and I, I always get there eventually, but there's usually four that come to mind straight away, and the fifth one's usually like, what is it again? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So. Oh, it's, that's great. And I, and I think, I mean, I know from experience that when you've got, when you've got people who genuinely – fit and live and breathe by those core values it just feel it just makes the business a whole lot easier doesn't it yeah it does indeed yeah, yeah. and we've actually we do you know the whole al well it's the eos mantra i guess of you know higher fire reward motivate yep. based on the core values right mm -hmm. and um he's very uh you know specific about that and he reinforces that a lot yep. and we have um you know we have sort of uh, cycled through, you know, a series of staff, you know, and it's not, not that they're not good people or whatever, but the core values are not aligned mm. and, you know, they go on and do things and end up somewhere b better off for themselves or whatever, where they're more tightly aligned with some, in a different environment. Yep. But um, the people that we have now is a very tight uh, group and, you know, works really well together. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sounds like you've been doing an amazing job. Hey, look, we're yeah. um, we're running out of time, sadly. I, I okay. could sit here and talk all day. But I, I love um, yeah. hearing about business success. But also, I mean, it's been interesting to hear, I think, that your story about losing sight of the core focus and growing to a point where it may look great from the outside, all these people, but in actual fact, it wasn't a profitable business anymore. That's a right. really interesting thing, I think, for people to, to, to think about. You know, are yeah. you really sticking to your core focus? Are you doing what is your core competency? Are you actually creating a profitable, sustainable business? Um, yeah. yeah, not just going for the um, the size. <laughs> right. Yeah, so for thanks sure. For sharing that. Appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Three top tips. What would you say your three top tips are, Glenn? Whether that be across you know EOS sales um, life in general. Yeah. So I always try, try to share something that's sort of uh, like offbeat and not not part of the book, and is, which is also is that you know when you're building a business and um building a business is great for uh also for you know building wealth and things like that mm -hmm. right so oftentimes you know money can come as a byproduct obviously if it becomes unsuccessful <laughs> there's no money but nonetheless if you're successful the money becomes an obvious and apparent um you know uh, byproduct of that yeah. right but oftentimes your, your health can be uh compromised in that process mm -hmm. and um <clears throat> you know from time to time over the years you know i'd allowed my health and, you know, and, um, you know, my health and my, my healthy habits, you know, to suffer. Right. And, um, you know, I've struggled a lot with, you know, uh, overeating because of stress, lack of exercise, not taking care of my health, you know, and it's had impacts that, you know, and when those things come up, the rest of it falls by the wayside immediately and becomes, meaningless right it doesn't matter how much money you have if you're not healthy yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so always put your health uh as a primary a prime directive for um you know uh and we're not perfect right you know you're going to go through times of ups and downs and whatever it's and we're at the beginning of january so everyone's recommitting everything you know but nonetheless keep an eye on your health at all times and and make sure you know you don't you don't put it aside in the, you know, I'm, you know, working long hours of day, not getting proper sleep, not eating correct. Mm -hmm. And maybe, um, you know, uh, 
you know, what drinking and things like that. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's, that would be tip number one. Yep. Yeah. Uh, tip number two is a funny thing from the book, not funny, but it's a funny saying, and it's called, you only get forever to make another impression. And, um, right. I can explain that. and so it's like, wait a minute. That's not what my mom taught me. Mm-hmm. My mom told me that first impressions are lasting impressions. Yep. And I'm like, well, yes, that's true. And so is the second one and the third one. And so I said, so the story goes in the book is that, you know, when you hear the boss's car pull up in the parking lot, you know, he drives that sports car and, you know, or you hear his footsteps or her footsteps coming down the hallway, be working really hard (laughs) at that moment in time. Yep. And when he walks by, he or she walks by your desk, do not be alt tabbing from Instagram (laughs) over to the CRM, Mm -hmm. right? Because whether you like it or not, he noticed and you made an impression and it wasn't a good one. Right. And, um, and so what I'm trying to say is that you're always making an impression. So always make a good impression. Oh, I was having a bad day. Oh, I was distracted because of such and such. No, like always be on. And, you know, so I always have a habit, you know, like if, uh, if my bosses or if, you know, if, if, a you know, somebody important was, was in my vicinity or whatever, I would figure out a way of interacting with them. Hey, I just have a quick question on this project we're working on. Yeah. And I was always on, always on and not, Oh, Hey, you got 27 minutes to stay, hang around the water cooler talking about football, hockey, you know, no, I mean the, uh, so you're always making an impression. Yep. So always make a good impression. Love it. Yep. Yeah. And third and final. Third tip. Yep. My third tip is never sit in the lobby, right? (laughs) (laughs) Because if you sit in the lobby and you're only 5'5", like me, and a six foot four uh, president of a company walks out to meet you, he's like four feet above you when he walks in, towering over you. You're distracted on your phone, looking at Instagram because you were bored. Show up on time. Don't be too early and don't be late be standing there with nothing distracting you Mm -hmm. and always have something in your hand and something in your mind. And that's the other tip, the bonus tip, which is, well, I got to go see the customer. What do I do? I said, well, just show up with something in your hand and something in your mind. Mm -hmm. It could be a data sheet. It could be, you know, a brochure. It could be the quotation that they asked for. It could be a box of donuts, which are very popular in Canada. (laughs) I don't know about down there. Um, You know, it could, but always have something in your hand to give to them. Mm -hmm. And always have something in your mind that you're there to talk to them about. Yeah, I love that. Don't be, you know, mm-hmm. and um, those are some of my tips. And there's 57 more in the book. Yep. Never, which is actually <laughs> called Never Sit in the Lobby. So that's a great sort of um, ending for it. Yeah. Thank you. It was interesting. Yeah. This takes me back to the time. So I actually, uh, my, my original, uh, what do you call it? My original career was actually in sales as well. So I used to work for the pharmaceutical company selling drugs into doctors. Oh, yeah. You know, all, <sighs> tough, yeah. tough job that um, because, you know, you spend a lot of time in waiting rooms. And the thing that I actually used to do is I used to go in with a little basket of gifts. And I'd actually asked both the receptionist right. and doctor to take a, to take a gift from the basket, and I'd use it to start a conversation about various things about the drug. Perfect. And um, it was just something I wanted to do because I was bored of sitting in waiting rooms. It was so much more fun yeah. to go in and do something like that. Yeah. Uh, but the rapport that you can build through just having a bit of fun with it, you know, not just being yeah. as serious as all the other medical reps were that came in day in day yeah. out. You know, I'm here to talk to you yeah. about X Y Z drug. So, yeah, something yeah. something in my hand, and I guess something in my yeah. in my mind as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Hey. And yeah, and, and never. Bring donuts after ten thirty because people get mad at you for because you're, you're you're getting too close to lunch, yeah, right? Enough, yeah. So you got to have something different if it's uh, if it's, a, it's a, just a joke we have, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, Brilliant. okay. So obviously people can get hold of the book, never sit in the lobby. Um, that's obviously on things like Amazon and your various bookstores. Yep. How do they get in contact with you, Glenn, if they want to speak to you? Yeah. So, um, so th- I have my website, glennpoulos.com. There's two N's in Glenn. Mm-hmm. So G L E N N P O U L O S.com. And all the links to socials are there where you'll see, uh, I'm most active is on LinkedIn and um really really highly engaged on on linkedin and i'm always happy to talk to anybody um so anyone can feel free to message me at any time on linkedin but i'm you know i'm on facebook and instagram and the other uh, applications as well um but yeah and i'm and you can also uh my email address and everything's on the website Mm -hmm. and 
happy to get, take an email from you and get back to you as well. I'm happy to talk about anything. Glenn, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Yeah, I really appreciate you, you sharing your experiences yeah. and sharing your tips and things with the listeners. Um, I shall look forward to seeing you um, hopefully pretty soon, actually, in yeah, Canada itself. Right. Yeah, but um, yeah. yeah, thanks for your time, and, and we'll, we'll talk yeah. again soon. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.